I'm Louise Harrison. I'm Save the Sounds New York Natural Areas Coordinator. And I wanna welcome you tonight where we're going to present New York Natural Heritage Program's report on their survey of Plum Island's marine habitats. The scientific dives around Plum Island were performed for the Heritage Program and sponsored by Save the Sound through the generosity of supporters, including an anonymous donor who presented a challenge match to help raise the funds. If you're new to Save the Sound, we're known for environmental action in the Long Island Sound region. We fight climate change, we save endangered lands, protect the sound and its rivers, and we work with nature to restore ecosystems. I'd like to introduce you to Save the Sound's president, Kurt Johnson. Well, thank you, Louise, and uh, so happy to see everybody tonight. I'm just going to spend a moment focused on saving endangered lands, which obviously Plum Island is right there at the pinnacle. Uh, we have, with your help, established a really exciting strategic plan to save these beautiful emeralds that surround the Long Island Sound bracelet and protect them for future generations. And I'll just mention a few of the places that we will protect with your help over the next five years. So Plum Island obviously is right up there. Lloyd Harbor, the seminary there, property we're working on very hard in Connecticut. We are fighting to protect the last wild mile of the Niantic River from development in Niantic Bay. And we're also focused on saving the last untapped reservoir from development. It's hard to believe, but there's the possibility that that could be sold off and never available along with the 10,000 acres along the forest that purify and protect it for future generations. Again, just uh, welcome. And if you haven't joined the Save the Sound, please consider doing so because you're the people that fuel us and make this happen. So I turn it back to you, Louise. Thank you so much, Kurt. You know, we do all this work uh, with partnerships and uh, I'm happy to say that our partnership with Save Mattituck Inlet it, um, is really strong. And uh, we're, we're following the direction of other groups for the seminary property, in particular, the North Shore Land Alliance. Save the Sound also leads the Preserve Plum Island Coalition. The coalition's membership is made up of 120 national, regional, and local organizations. Together, we're working to permanently preserve the federally owned Plum Island and its natural, historical, and cult cultural resources. I'd like to make a special welcome tonight to the coalition's membership this evening, as well as to all of you Plum Island preservation advocates that are joining us here. So now let's get down to it. I eager to introduce our speakers. First, you're gonna meet Dr. Matt Schlesinger, the Chief Zoologist of the New York Natural Heritage Program. The scientific diving for the New York Natural Heritage Program was conducted by Inner Space Scientific Diving owned by Stephen Ressler. Steve, our second speaker, will follow Matt and present alongside the third person you're going to meet, New York Natural Heritage Program's marine zoologist, Megan McCormick. Meg and Steve will be sharing the amazing discoveries of marine life around Plum Island. Matt, take it away. Thank you, Louise. It's a pleasure to be presenting this uh, exciting work to all of you. I'm going to give a, a very brief introduction to the Natural Heritage Program and our history with, uh, of involvement with Plum Island. It's been a very special place for us to have the privilege to work for over 10 years. And uh, so I'll just give you a little overview and then, and then I'll be turning it over to Steve to talk about 
the recent uh, dive survey. So just a quick outline, uh, a little bit about Nef New York Natural Heritage Program, as I mentioned, then the dive survey planning, because planning is a big part of uh, any dive effort and the methodology used in the dive. A virtual tour of the dive transects and, and um, some of the remarkable biodiversity that we observed during the dives and some details on, on those species. And then a little bit on uh, the, uh, the future directions and, and then the Q&A, as, as Louise mentioned. So who is the Natural Heritage Program? Well, um, every U.S. state has a New York Natural has a New York Natural Heritage Program. That's good. Every state has a Natural Heritage Program, uh, and they were founded uh, by the Nature Conservancy starting in the 1970s, uh, and and then farmed out to different uh, state governments and, and universities, uh, in um, in different arrangements in every state. And these are biodiversity data centers primarily. They're they're uh, um, centers of uh, inventory and record keeping for the state's uh, rare plants, rare animals, rare habitats. So our program was founded in 1985, 1986. Um, and so we've been uh, almost 40 years now in partnership with uh, the State Department of Environmental Conservation um, in whose office in Albany we, we um, have our home. We're also overseen and, and coordinated by a, a network called NatureServe. That's a, a national global nonprofit uh, that, um, that coordinates the work of natural heritage programs all across the world. Um, one more logo to, to shout at you, which is the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry. And that is our um, administrative home in the New York Natural Heritage Program. So there's a lot of agencies, a lot of organizations involved here, but um, the, the main um, the main message here is that uh, we've been doing it this a long time. Uh, our primary focus is biodiversity inventory, determining the status of, of rare species and rare habitat types all across New York. And, uh, and it, in the last few years, five or six years, we've started to work in marine environments. Which brings me to Plum Island. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, there's, there's Plum Island, of course, in the yellow circle. Uh, part of the archipelago that runs um, all the way from essentially from New York City out toward Connecticut. And, and you can see that um, Plum Island is, is in the town of Southold, so and, and part of Suffolk County, as is Fishers Island to the northeast there. And, um, and the waters around Plum Island are surrounded by the and influenced by the Long Island Sound, Block Island Sound, and the Peconic Estuary. So it sits at a really interesting junction of, of environments. We were first um, brought into uh, the, the uh, Plum Island story in around 2011, when the Nature Conservancy funded us to assemble all the information we could about Plum Island, because at the time, uh, scientists and researchers were not allowed on the island. They were preparing the island for sale. The island had been put up for sale. Louise can tell you a lot more about, about that story if you're not familiar with it. But we gathered together available information and put that out in a report and made the case for future and inventory of the island, which we were finally allowed to complete in 2015. So that report came out in 2016, Plum Island's Biodiversity Inventory. This was terrestrial and, and freshwater focused. So all the, you know, the island itself, uh, if you, if you um, want to put it that way, uh, we were focused on plants and animals and, and, um, and natural communities of the island. Uh, Save the Sound then approached us in about 2018, 2019, saying we have uh, donors who are interested in the marine environment. We had made the case for understanding the marine environment around Plum Island um, in our previous work. And, uh, and we were very fortunate to be able to, to fund or to have funded an initial survey of Plum Island's marine habitats. And that report came out in 2020. So all these reports are available at, at the Natural Heritage Program's website. You don't have to copy that down. There will be a link in the chat uh, a little later. In that initial survey of uh, Plum Island's marine habitats, uh, we identified four, four kind of micro habitats, what we might call, what we called at the time character areas, um, areas where the substrate and, and vegetation and, and animals appeared to be different. So sort of um, what, what uh, our chief ecologist would call natural communities. 
different kinds of natural communities around Plum Island. And, and in um, doing further survey work, we wanted to explore those in greater depth, literally, and, uh, and really figure out the biodiversity associated with those different types. And that brings me to uh, this last year's survey. Um, I'm proud to announce that our report of, uh, of the, this recent dive um, is now available. And, um, and we're gonna put a link to the chat at the end uh, where you can uh, download it and read it yourself. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Steve Ressler to talk about the mechanics of, of assembling this team of people and, and uh, conducting the dive. I'm going to run through this quickly. We, we have limited time and I have a tendency to sometimes to give too much detail and we run out of time. So Interspace Scientific Diving is a small niche company that provides services, diving, scientific diving and related services primarily to government agencies and academic institutions. Um, I'll leave it at that. There's not a lot of work in this kind of work um, unless you work for a full-time academic institution or government agency that has its own scientific divers. Some don't. And the ones that don't are the people that we work for. This will be our second foray. We'll dive into the waters around Plum Island. Uh, Dan Morelli in the left-hand photograph on the right, and myself um, with the two divers in 2019. This is an example of our collaborators, partners, clients, it's a partial list, but they're the people we've done the most recent work um, since the company was formed in 2008. Um, the Scientific Diving International at the bottom of that list is owned by one of the partners in the 2021 dive and the 2019 dive, that's Dan Morelli, who is the owner of Scientific Diving International. So he was along on the trip last year. When we were asked to go back um, and conduct a more in-depth, and the pun is intended, um, survey around Plum Island, we wanted to be more quantitative than we were in, with the 2019 work. As Matt said, we generally described four character areas, but we didn't do much in the way of quantifiable data. We couldn't get anything that would tell us how many individuals, individual species were in a given amount of space, for example. We weren't able to describe distances between character, character areas or anything like that. So in the second attempt, we wanted to get some quantitative information, still some qualitative information, but we also had limited time to do that in as we did in 2019. And we had to design a method of conducting commonly used, accepted, and pretty close to gold standard transect quadrat survey methods. So the image you see now was one of the options we looked at um, where we would run a line from generally a 30-foot contour line off Plum Island for up to 1,500 feet from shore, whichever came first, and then dropping these squares that we call quadrats, and then you'll see a picture of what they look like as we move along every 10 meters or so until we reach 10 feet of water and then stop. We had no idea how many of those we would have to do in a given distance. So we dropped that one and moved to another one. Go another slide here. Now this one would give us a very good representation of what we have in each of the character areas. Um, we could do four to seven of these, perhaps, perhaps in five days. But again, we're looking at well, 14 quadrats along a line, a meter square, in a minimum of four character areas. That really wouldn't cover much of the aerial extent or the, the whole area that we wanted to try and cover so that we could get as much information as we could over as large an area as we could with what we have in personnel and time. This one would have taken too much work. So we tried another one. And we tried double transects running side by side 
um, which also would have taken a considerable amount of time. It would have taken two teams in the water at a time. And we skipped that one. In the end, next slide. We decided on this. And what you're looking at is a single line transect in blue. You'll see land at the bottom. The start would be up where the diver is just below the water line. And it says 10 feet. Actually, um, that's a 30 foot depth or 15, approximately 1500 foot distance from shore. That would be our start position. And we would drop down where you see the middle star put our meter square quadrant at the bottom there and begin the survey. When we were able to describe what's inside that quadrant, we'd move it to the left to right, 10 feet, approximately 10 feet to the side, do the same thing, move back to the middle. We had a compass bearing we'd work from, follow the line to the next uh, place where we would do our sampling and data gathering and then repeat that until we reached a minimum depth of 10 feet surface and end it. We decided to use depths as the area where we would drop our quadrats and do that work because, again, we had no idea how many quadrats we'd have to do because we didn't have any accurate contours with distances uh, offshore there. So we used depths as our quadrat locations. And because we were interested in knowing whether or not there are any differences between or with uh, the species colonizing that area at different depths. A lot of logistics went into this. Um, a considerable or months of logistics went into it. We had to find a motel or a hotel or any place where we could stay that um, would take government rates at the height of the summer vacation season. And the Silver Sands Motel did that for us. They also did it in 2019 and that alone was extremely generous on their part because their rates are normally double to triple uh, government rates at, on that part of Long Island. Uh, we had to figure out, once we figured out how we would do our transects and quadrants, we had to figure out what kind of supplies we would need. A lot went into that and a lot of packing went into it. And we also include more than we need just in case we need it. Then we had to transport it. Uh, we sent it in two trucks down to Greenport uh, where the Silver Sands also gave us a former bar and event space that we could use as our own meeting space and set up as our laboratory, field lab. Next slide, please. This is the entire survey crew, not just the divers. Uh, the divers are obviously in the top photo. Uh, it's Dan Morelli. Uh, Dan is an invertebrate biologist, which when it was time to assemble a team here, he was at the top of my list because the place is loaded with invertebrates and he's the guy to go to for invertebrate biology. I'm the bald guy in the middle. Janet Clem is the third person. Um, Janet is a biologist, recently retired from Florida DEP. She's also a career scientific diver and has been doing it for decades. And the last on the right is Dave Winkler. Dave is initially a geologist and uh, a field ecologist and research specialist with reference to the Polytechnic and its Daring Freshwater Institute. All four of us have worked together for 16 years on various projects, primarily for RPI, the Darren Freshwater Institute um, on Lake George. Uh, the bottom left-hand photo is the entire survey crew that includes uh, Eileen Marenstein and uh, Paul Ahern um, and some of the camera crew that Eileen contracted with uh, to come out and film what was going on topside. Uh, that's uh, Nancy Sertag in the far lower left corner of that photograph, Eddie O'Connor with his hands on his knees in the foreground, Eileen and Eileen and Paul are in the background. Next slide, please. Two survey vessels, uh, we use Long Island Soundkeeper, the Lucy and Company uh, donated their 25 foot Parker for the whole week. And Paul Acern, Ahern donated his 27 foot Boston Whaler. The uh, Soundkeeper's Parker was our primary dive vessel. We needed the open deck space that that had on it. 
Uh, it was essentially stationary while we did each transect. And then Paul's boat was both the diver support and chase boat that followed the divers along most of the length of their transects. And if we had to communicate and pop up and talk, we would do that with uh, him or Meg, who was often on that boat, or Louise, um, pass equipment or samples back and forth, and just for diver safety. Uh, the currents there are very strong, which you'll see in the next slide. And there are times when we had to use the boat, uh, Paul's boat, to get back to the uh, anchored Parker. It can't always swim against the currents there, depending on what the tide is like. And the currents exist at all times. There is no slack tide um, around Plum Island. So if that video runs, you can see what's taking place in the surface on a pretty good day. But the wind is blowing. We have waves. We're in a protected area on the north side of the island here. The wind, I think, is coming out of the south, and we still have waves of movement here. So what you see happening on the surface is what's happening on the bottom. And once below the surface, you can have currents moving in two different directions, uh, only five feet apart in depth, apart from each other. So you might just send to 20, 25 feet and have the current moving in one direction. And then the last five to 10 feet, it will be moving in another direction. And you can't usually swim directly against it. It'll push you from one side or the other. It'll meet you head on or it'll push you from the rear. So it's not an easy place to dive. It's not a place for most recreational divers. Next slide, please. Dave was asked to take a clip, live clip uh, of himself going over the gunnel backwards. This is our standard entry method. It's almost from the diver's perspective. This is a video of uh, Janet with a sample bag and me jamming some algae into it. Um, the zip logs are our favored uh, collection device. You see a yellow bag to the side that holds all of our different sampling tools and, and collecting jars and bottles and bags. And our samples go in that bag also. So it gets fairly heavy toward the end of the dive and has to be dragged around with us. Let's move to the next slide. Uh, these are, this is what each diver has with them. Um, the top left photo is Dan working in the eelgrass beds. You can see just above or alongside his left hand, a black and white item. That's, a, that's one of the quadrats. There's a picture of a quadrat directly below that picture. And he's got a, a pencil in his hand, which is tied to a clipboard, which has a data sheet that you see on the right in it, in which the diver records what they see visually or what they might expose if they dig around the set and they can move rocks, rocks around. Top right hand corner is uh, a housing with a light for a camera. Below that looks like a watch. It is a watch, but it's a dive computer and it records your, your dive time while you're diving, actual time, water temperature, depth, uh, when you start rising too fast and it sends out a beep. Uh, but that is a mini dive computer. Directly below that are analog gauges, uh, which I tend to favor over electronics in the water, which uh, show you your air uh, supply, gas supply, if you're using something other than standard air and a compass, and uh, there is a depth gauge in there. And in the last in the far left corner is the uh, favorite zip, Ziploc sample bag. We also use tubes, centrifuge tubes, but they're really neat for animals or other things that you don't want to have crushed with other organisms. Next slide, please. What we couldn't identify in the field off the top of our heads, or we couldn't, or aren't positive about, uh, were bagged, sampled, or jarred or bottled and brought back to the field lab where they were sorted. Um, sometimes identified back at the lab uh, using keys that we had, um, using a sterile microscope for things that are very small. And those that we couldn't identify immediately were prepared, uh, preserved and prepared for subsequent identification by, for example, the algae work was done by um, for now called with extension, Steve Schott was the principal there uh, for that effort. And Dan lugged quite a few things back to his home in Tallahassee, Florida, where he preserved them and oftentimes had to put them in solutions and let them open up and be dissected before we could possibly ID them. Uh, the next slide is just an image of, what, of some algae be through all the lens of a stereo microscope 
this is the kind of detail you've got to look at in order to ID some of these species. Next slide, please. And we start with Megan, I think, here. Thanks, Steve. Um, hey guys, this is just a map of our transect locations. Um, so you can see the color coding um, has to do with the depth. So deeper colors are, are deeper water. So we can see plum gut here on the left side of the island um, on the western shore. And the start locations of the transects were generally at 30 feet. Um, but you can tell on the North Shore that we're still pretty close to shore. Um, that's a really steep drop there um, in depth. On the South Shore, the slope is gentler, so we had to start a little further offshore. Um, so I'm going to start this tour of the transects at S2. Um, so just keep that in mind. And I think Matt stopped sharing, so I can pull it up. And let me know, um, someone let me know if you're seeing Google Earth. I see it. Okay, great. Um, so we're going to start on the south shore. So down here um, at our first transect, which is transect S2. Um, and this area is really dominated by sand. Um, we got some small rocks, um, sometimes medium size, maybe less than 10 centimeters in diameter. Um, and anytime that happens, you can have algae attached to it. But this area is really a lot of sand. Um, and this is where we saw um, some jellyfish. This is a lion's mane jellyfish. Um, and this is just showing an example. You can see it's sandy. We have some broken shells for maybe some bivalves and then um, uh, algae growing um, attached to the surface. We move a little further to the east. Um, you can see even in the, um, the satellite image, we're getting to have some larger boulders. This is a channeled whelk that was sampled here. Um, this, photo is kind of blurry, but you can see we've got like some large boulders inside the quadrat, so a little different than the previous one. Um, this is a lady crab that was swimming off. Um, but it's patchy, right? So this is why we take more than one quadrat at, at a single depth, because um, some quadrats um, end up just being sand. Um, so if you don't take replicates at a certain depth, we wouldn't know that. If we move even farther to the east, um, this becomes a little rougher area. Um, we have a little higher prevalence of boulders. Um, this is where we saw some gray seals hauling out so that it, they actually cut our transect serving um, a little short um, because they were in the area and we didn't want to be in the water at the same time as them. Um, this will give you an example of kind of the size of the rocks that we're talking about in this area. And this is just a side profile of one of the transects. Um, now we're going to go over to the west side of the island, which is where the eelgrass um, meadow was that we sampled. Um, we found a lot of invertebrates living um, within the eelgrass. Um, some of the quadrats look like this, so this might be maybe, I don't know, 20 or 30 percent coverage of eelgrass, um, but other quadrats were almost 80 or 90 percent eelgrass, um, just depending on where we were in the meadow. Um, this is farther offshore, so we only found eelgrass at, at 10 and 20 feet depths. When we got to the 30 feet quadrat, um, we're having sand and some red algae. We move now to the north shore uh, of the island. We had two transects over here, N2 and N6. They're, they're pretty similar. Um, here we're seeing um, some anemones and bryozoans. You can see this um, diver is using a light to shine on a boulder. Um, we saw starfish in these transects. Um, these are northern star corals. There, we'll see more pictures of them later. Steve has a video. Um, and this to give you a size reference. So the, sometimes the, the whole quadrat would be taken up by um, a boulder and we covered in algae and bryozoans. Kind of similar story at this transect. Um, we, you can see some kelp in these ones. Um, this is some sugar kelp that's being grazed upon by snails. You can see a lot of red algae. Um, but this was interesting. We didn't find this in 2019. When we got to the 30 feet depth of these transects, it was mostly silt. Um, so, you know, the, the, the water is not as um, strong there, the currents, and you get this kind of settling out of these fine sediments. So that was something new we found. And then in our last transect, um, I think this is probably what excited the divers the most. Um, we had a lot of anemones, um, large boulders again. Um, this lined anemone was not found in 2019 and we found a ton of it this year. 
Um, also, any time that you have these large boulders, um, we saw juvenile fish. These are juvenile sea bass, black sea bass. Um, some more northern star corals and bryozoans. And here is an example of what this kind of habitat looks like. So I think I will have Matt, if you can share the slides again. So when we're talking about vegetation, we're mostly talking about macroalgae, but I did want to point out that um, eelgrass is a plant, so it's a vascular plant. Um, so that's the first picture that will come up. Um, then we have three different types of macroalgae. So we have red algae, brown algae, and green algae. There you go, there's the eelgrass. And some of the red algae is really filamentous, some's more branching. Um, some are like really thick blades. It's something that you can identify pretty easily underwater. Um, sometimes we just had to list things as unidentified algae because you need a microscope to tell. Um, this is an example of brown algae. So rockweed is really common in the intertidal zone, but we see it too subtidally. Um, and then the last photo is just some, some green algae. So that was probably the least common type that we surveyed. I'm going to send it back to Steve to discuss some of the species we saw. Okay, we're going to run through this very fast because it's taking a lot of time. Uh, sponges, or as it says, were widely distributed. We found them everywhere. There was some kind of hard substrate. Uh, in some areas, they would cover a quarter of a boulder or sometimes more. Um, sometimes we would find sponges growing on a mollusk, like a clam. Um, or crepidula shell or whelk shell, um, but they're usually found on, on stones. Next slide, please. Tenophores and nidarians, jellyfish and comb jellies. On the left, first, you've got a lion's mane jellyfish. On the right, uh, this is a color corrected video. What you see right now is what we see as we're diving. And on the right, when we make all that green go away, you see more color. That video, by the way, was from 2019. We have plenty of jellyfish pictures. Uh, and what was interesting about that video is the fish that you see swimming around the bottom of the umbra or of the, of the jellyfish. So that's a bumper, and they're much more common farther south than Plum Island. Next slide, please. This is a comb jelly. Most people who swim around Long Island are familiar with them. They're very common throughout the region, but it's just an example. Nidarians, uh, anemones on the far left, uh, the remains of star coral when it dies is the next slide, the calcium deposits uh, of a, I don't like to call it dead, but there's no animal there anymore. The third slide is live star coral. It's the white that you see surrounded by sponge. And on the far right is the lined anemone that we saw for the first time during our last dive, which as Meg said, was for, for us the most exciting dive because there was just so much there and it was so dense. Um, we didn't do as much detailed work there as we had hoped to because it was the last dive of the week. Next slide, please. Bryozoans on, are on everything, every hard substrate, everywhere. They are, to me, the greatest influences, influences here, influencers here. They cover, like I said, everyone has said, they cover every hard, hard substrate, but they add to the physical, um, biological um, complexity of the area. They provide cover for all, all manner of species, fish and other species. Um, they grow on other species. In the top right-hand corner here, you have bryozoans growing on a red algae. Um, in the lower right-hand corner, that's under the stereoscope. What you see at the tip of those branches are polyps. Uh, that's part of the, the bryozoan that feeds, for example. Um, caprellids, I wanna mention them, caprella amphipods. That's one of Dan's favorites. Um, they're kind of like a, a skeleton shrimp would be a common name for them. They look like a shrimp, but very skinny, long appendages everywhere, kind of freaky looking. Next slide, please. It's just a video. Some of you are, have already seen this one of Bryozoans swaying the current. They look like plants, but they're not. 
There you hear me have rhizomes on the left, in the middle, and on the right, with red algae growing above it. Uh, worms are everywhere in all sediments and growing on rocks. The lower left hand corner is uh, a tube worm withdrawn, excuse me, inside that tube that attaches itself and grows and lives on rock. The top left is a, another tube worm that has created a home for itself by taking sand and whatnot and forming it around or forming it to make its home or a tube. And that's the tremendous numbers of those are in the eelgrass beds off the west side of the island, but they're also anywhere else we have relatively soft sand and or silt sediments. Next slide, please. Sandy areas, they look barren of life, but they're not. You can just scratch the surface a little bit. They're all manner of organisms. If we had done more uh, sampling with the sediment, we would have come back with the organisms that are found on the surface of it and under the surface of sediments is called benthos, and it's from microscopic organisms to macro organisms like clams, for example, oysters. Um, rules the world in the marine environment. The, the I call it a, a, a biogeochemical complex, and everything that takes place there dictates the quality of the values of the water body above the bottom and what species occupy it and how it's used. So to me, the benthos rules. Next slide, please. Sea stars, everyone knows what they are. If you just click that real quick and we'll just get a second here. Um, the, this is a video of a sea star walking across the bottom. It's very slow. This is in real, that's how fast they move. Um, but there are hundreds of feet, tiny feet underneath each of those arms, all moving in unison to get that critter to move. Next slide, please. Bivalves and gastropods. Uh, bivalves would be a clam, a scallop, an oyster. Uh, gastropods are snails. Um, there are quite a few of them there. Uh, again, if we had done more digging deeper uh, into the sediments, we're pretty sure we would have found more than we did. Next slide, please. Crepidula here. Um, crepidula, um, growing crepidula is a, a type of mollusk attached to and growing on other crepidula. Crepidula. Next slide, please. Snails, moon snail. Most people are familiar with that. Um, Meg mentioned this before. Um, these snails are feeding on um, kelp and a copy of a um, whelk superimposed on one of our data sheets. Next slide, please. Crabs, I said we have two slides of these, hermit crabs, different types. Um, if we can just hit that video, we have a hermit crab in a whelk shell scuttling away and he gets in the way of a spider crab or which moves away from it. I don't know if you caught that. And there's a comb jelly in the foreground now, it's certainly out of, a little bit out of focus here, a little bit to the left of the hermit crab. So lots of crabs. Uh, next slide, true crabs. The top is a video of a spider crab. He was originally found inside our quadrat. He escaped. So we forced him back into the quadrat. So we have a picture of him. Um, in 2019, we didn't come back with a lot of information on fish. We came back with more this time. Uh, we had a few images, mostly video of very small juveniles in 2019, but we had more in number this time than we had in 2019. Uh, probably because we went earlier in the season when there are more juveniles around this time. Um, what you see in the top right, top photograph here are uh, juvenile black sea bass. And the bottom is scup, which is a color corrected image 
Um, the original image of that had that dark green. You can barely see the fish in it. Um, we weren't sure what they were because they were at the edge of our visibility. They weren't really close to us. And we it couldn't even see the shape. So we called them ghost fish until we got one close enough to realize that these are scuff. Next. And these, the area is loaded with juveniles. You can go to the next slide. No, the video, please. The place is loaded with juveniles. And most of the north side is ideal as a nursery area for juveniles. The rock profiles off the bottom, all of the vegetative and, and animal growth there provide both protection from predators, protection from currents. Uh, the space in between all these, the hard surfaces and all the different organism crusty organisms are growing on those bolts, providing interstitial space for other organisms that are also food for juveniles. So it's it's very rich. We didn't find many adults other than scup and an occasional blackfish. Um, I wanted to cover this one. Uh, carefully at the color correction taking place here, and you'll see a lot of juvenile fish in the lower part of the screen. They were hardly visible to us with a naked eye, and it, they don't become that visible until we do a color correction, one, which brings us to seals. They're visible on the surface. They're visible if they're really close to you. But on the right, if you start that video, this is a that's a video from 2019. We didn't get any in-water video of them this year. But carefully in the background here, um, go back and start again. Right in the middle of that screen, something's moving. And if you look here, there it is. You can see it's the head of a gray seal. We had neither I running the camera and looking elsewhere instead of through the camera all the time, nor Dan with a gray seal four to five feet away from this faceplate, knew that that seal was there watching Dan as he's writing his note on the data sheet. So they're there, they come close, we just don't see them. Uh, Meg mentioned we did not complete one of our transects on the south southeast side. That's because um, while we were doing our second set of quadrats there and had finished them and we we're about ready to move to the third, our bag with our tools and the samples we had already collected and everything else was gone. Um, we searched for it, didn't find it until we came to the surface and that's when we saw the seals. They were apparently all around. We had no idea at the time. Uh, some of the surface crew saw them and we blamed the seals on stealing our supplies. Next, we go to Meg now for results. Thanks, Steve. All right. Um we're a little over time, so I'll go through this pretty quick. Um, but this is just some of the ways that we wanted to kind of start to visualize our data. I mean, all these bar graphs are different colors. They correspond with what percentage of the quadrats um, were the different types of sediments. So you can see on the South Shore, um, there's lots of sandy areas in this kind of green, light green color. Um, also eelgrass beds on the west, Western Shore. Um, but as we get to those Northern sites, we're getting that dark red. Um, which is um, rocks or boulders greater than a meter in size. Um, you can go to the next one, Matt. Um, we did the same thing for vegetation, but just looking at the top five categories of what we found. Um, so we only found eelgrass in the orange on, on the western areas at those two shallower depths. Um, we found red algae all around the island, although not all of them we could identify while we were underwater. Um, Irish moss is another kind of red algae, but it's very conspicuous. You can identify it in the field, so that's why that one's separate. Um, and then we saw mostly um, the kelp in the same areas that we saw the large boulders. That's where they are like to attach. Right, next slide, Matt. Okay, so we identified 126 species this year. It's more than double than 2019. Um, and I think like a large part of that is that we had two additional divers. So we, we were able to sample many more quadrats. Um, Dan did a great job IDing all of the invertebrates. And also um, Steve Schott at Cornell Cooperative was a huge help in identifying the algae. Some of those are very difficult to ID even under the stereoscope. You have to look for certain reproductive structures and he really helped us identify a lot more. Um, this figure um, on the left is a heat map, um, and it's showing on the x-axis is all of our quadrats, and the y-axis is the different types of sediments. So if there's a red color, that indicates that that area has a really high prevalence of that kind of se sediment type. Um, so you can see we've got areas of silt, um, areas with mostly sand, some that are a mix, 
and then some that are really dominated by those large boulders. And what we want to do with this data um, is what our ecologists do when they do quadrat data is to use that um, percent coverages to define a natural community. So in the center image, um, this work has been done for terrestrial systems. And um, you can see the brown is the maritime dunes and then the kind of teal color is the rocky intertidal. Um, so having this hard data, this quantitative data that has these cutoff values um, associated with different kinds of habitats, we're gonna be able to start mapping um, subtitle natural communities. And we started to do that um, with some of our results from previous work on the eelgrass meadow um, on the Western side. And I would like to say there are other eelgrass meadows, smaller eelgrass meadows um, on the South shore that Cornell Cooperative Extension um, monitors. And they were out there at the same time as us. Um, I didn't, we didn't present their results here because their biomonitoring is slightly different um, than what we were doing, um, but they, they do exist. This isn't the only one. Um, and I think that we're gonna move to Louise. We have a lot of people to thank and questions and hopefully I didn't spend too much time. <laughs> well, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Matt and Steve and Meg for your wonderful presentation. I wanna take a moment to emphasize how many organizations and people were involved in supporting this amazing endeavor. There really was an amazing amount of coordination, cooperation, camaraderie, energy, and hard work. There were discounts, there was volunteerism. The North Fork came together for this dive. We thank all the supporters here on the North Fork. It was just an incredible five days last August. And with all the months of preparation and ensuing months of careful study and analysis, for almost a year long program, Thank you to our wonderful donors, the New York Natural Heritage Program and Interspace Scientific Diving. The scientific dives around Plum Island really helped to make the case for why Plum Island should be preserved in the national interest in perpetuity. We think Plum Island deserves to be proclaimed a national monument or be preserved by other means available to the federal government. Plum Island is a national treasure. Please support the campaign to save Plum Island by visiting savethesound.org. Or if you're an organization, join the coalition at preserveplumisland.org. So now we're going to work on some of the questions that have come in this evening. And um, I'm gonna take one of them uh, myself right now of, of why people might not want to be in the water uh, with gray seals. First of all, safety first. Uh, gray seals are predators and dangerous and strong, but moreover, they're protected uh, by the marine mammal protection laws and no one should get within 150 feet of a seal if possible. Of course, our divers didn't always know that there were seals nearby because the waters weren't so clear as Dave explained. We have another question that I will um, pass along to any of the scientists who, who can answer this. Um, I don't believe we saw any Brant, but the question was, um, are wintering or stopover Brant geese associated with the, with the eelgrass? So I don't know if anybody noticed Brant. I did not when I was out on the water that day. All right, um, let's see. No, I didn't see any brand at all. Okay. We wouldn't expect them, I'll, I'll add, in, in the summer. I mean, they are wintering, oops. Uh, they are wintering birds in, in New York waters. Um, I'm not sure whether they're eelgrass affiliates or not, but so I'll, I'll stop there. But it, it, we wouldn't have seen them in August, of, of course. I also think that on the west side, it was too deep for Brant to get to. It didn't go deeper than 20 to 30 feet, but it was generally between, say, a dozen feet to 20 feet deep. Thank you. Another question. Um, were there any surprises? For the divers, yes. That last dive was fantastic for us. Um, 
it was just there was just so much packed into that one area and and finding the lined anemones for example that's the long ghosty looking white anemone you saw in some of the pictures numbered in the thousands on the sides and other sides of boulders the same with the anemones the, the more common anemone that you see you saw in most of these pictures that we find almost anywhere but the lined anemone were only found at that last on that last dive on that last tra transect when we knew it was the last one we didn't have time to go back and look around anymore or even do a more in-depth um survey with quadrants in the area i think that was one where we did uh a single transect uh, with quadrats along the center line of the transect instead of branching out on both sides for sampling there. So if well, I were to go back, I would want to go back to that area and spend some time there. Once you get engrossed in these things, you always feel like there's not enough time. Um, we have one question about what the uh, the scientists feel are the most significant findings of the 2021 dives. I'll leave that to Matthew and Meg. Uh, I'll start, but um, Meg, I encourage you as one of the people who are out there, <laughs> actually out there on the boat most of the days or all the days um, to chime in too. Um, and I was gonna say this in response to the question about a surprise, but the, uh, and, and what I heard from all the divers uh, was that it was it's a pretty undisturbed environment and there's very little influence of uh, obvious influence of, of human activity and human visitation um, and and that you know that's something that that um, Save the Sound talked about a little bit in its press releases last summer but um, but it's worth noting again that um, it's a relatively undisturbed marine ecosystem, and that's rare for Long Island, for the East Coast. You, I could, you could say, at least for the Northeast Coast, um, in our part of the world, it's, it's, that's not common. It, it mirrors what we found on some of the uh, terrestrial parts of the island, too. The beaches of Plum Island are, you know, relatively, I won't say relatively pristine, but they're, they're in great condition. And I think that's, that's fair to say of uh, the subtitle environments around Plum Island, too. I will interject. We didn't find one piece of trash, one bottle, one bottle cap, not even a fish, piece of fishing line on the bottom. And it exists everywhere around Long Island. Anything to add, Megan? Yeah, I'll just add, um, you know, some of these like habitats are really rare. We don't have many of them on Long Island. You know, eelgrass is decreasing, rocky intertidal areas, we don't have much. And these areas right off the rocky intertidal, these subtidal areas that have these large boulders, really unique. And just for one small island to have all these different natural communities surrounding it, um, really special. And you know why we want to know where they are is so that like each might require a different kind of management strategy, a different kind of monitoring. Um, so really knowing the extent of these areas is, was really important and um, exciting just to see things change um, so quickly. Yeah, I think I would say it's a microcosm, a mini, a mini Long Island. Every environment that you would find around Long Island, we've got around Plum Island in one small area. So uh, people from the Natural Heritage Program, my question is, um, do you think that we have enough of a basis now to begin designing a baseline study that could be used in the future for management planning at Plum Island. Matt or Meg? I can, I can start. Um, I think we have a great, a great beginning for, uh, for thinking about management strategies surrounding the island. Um, it, you ask scientists whether we should survey more or research more. <laughs> The answer is yes, of course we should. We should know more. We should spend more time in the water. We should get to know the biodiversity better. There's always something more to study, right? Um, so there's no end to the quest for knowledge in the science and conservation world. But um, I think with a really good start on a, a map of the natural communities surrounding the island, you can think hard about what kind of activities would be uh, most appropriate in each of those, each of those communities. Um, 
and uh, and knowing the biodiversity, you know, knowing some of the species that are there, thinking about which ones might be rare for for New York or for Long Island, and which ones might be might be common helps us uh, helps us determine whether some need, need special protection, uh, whether some are less sensitive to to human influence. So I, I think we we have a good a good start at that. And that you know, the, whatever happens to Plum Island. It will take a large conversation like the ones that Louise and her team are, are having already, um, but about the, the marine environment is, is in, in some ways um, we're thinking about in, in sort of in a separate way from that of the terrestrial island. I mean, they're, they're connected and it's important to think of them as, as one big ecosystem, but it's also true that the marine environments need uh, different kinds of considerations, different kinds of attention. So I think, um, we have a good start. And, and I, before I, uh, I just jump in and say that um, we are, we, through these uh, surveys you've done, uh, you're helping to inform uh, future management of the marine mammal and sea turtle protection area that New York State put into place a few years ago. Um, that also includes Great Gull and Little Gull Islands. Um, Megan, did you have anything you wanted to add? Well, I covered it. Thanks. Uh, so we have a lot of questions. I wanted to let you know we're at the end of our scheduled hour, but we can stay on longer because we have some more questions. Um, if you need to leave, uh, feel free to do so. You will get a copy of the um, webinar and you will get your copy of the report. Um, you can sign up for future emails and updates about Plum Island and other things from Save the Sound. Uh, the, we're going to put the link up in the chat. You can um, grab it there, um, save the sound.org or preserve plum island.org if you want to be a member of the Preserve Plum Island Coalition. Um, and so I'll go back to questions now in case people have to leave. We have a few more minutes. Um, there, there was one question uh, from a marine scientist who um, would, would like to interact with uh, some of you on um, species identification going forward. So I would just, uh, I'll just forward that information over to you. We can do that offline uh, sometime. Um, Lisa, I think I know what happened with that too. I'm seeing it. Um, I changed the photo last minute and didn't change text. So everyone that's saying about the, that's your, you're correct. <laughs> okay, do you wanna clarify it for the, now that you're on? Same yeah, the, the carpedula, a couple of people mentioned carpedula, the, the slipper snail photo that we had was not the right species. And I changed the photo last minute and didn't oh. update the text. So uh, I, was look, I was looking at my sheet instead of the screen. Okay. Well, <laughs> we're all friends here. We'll get it right. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Megan. That's no problem at all. And thank you uh, to our uh, visitors and uh, guests who are noticing these things. You know, science is all about communication and inter interchange of information. Just a quickie, I think someone asked about water samples. We didn't take any. We weren't doing any water chemistry. We had some water temperature. Um, what, what would really be nice if we could ever get a chance to do it would be uh, current direction, speed, accurate water temperatures from the top of the water column to the bottom. We could relate that to what we see going on on the bottom. Um, plankton toes really get into the nitty gritty here uh, as food sources and collections of, call it a plankton toe if you want, across the top of boulders that, that's, that are loaded with bryozoans and algae. So we get a lot of the microscopic or really tiny critters that we don't see and don't pick up with our fingers and put in bags. So sometime in the future, it would be great if someone could do that, so. Okay, future work. Uh, so we have a bunch of questions. Um, uh, for instance, did anybody see any seahorses? Did anybody see any mussels? Um, let's see. Uh, uh, I didn't see any mussels this trip. We saw plenty in 2019 off the south side. And they were up near the surface, close to the surface of the water on the top of the boulders that are sometimes exposed that the seals sit on. Um, I looked hard for seahorses and didn't see one. So. Okay, how about uh, horseshoe crabs was another question. Anybody see them? No. Okay. Why aren't fish bothered by jellyfish? Uh, geez. 
I don't have the answer to that one right away. I know that some fish have a symbiotic relationship. Yeah, with some, some, will live, some will live inside the body, not, not just among the tentacles underneath them or among them, mm -hmm. but some fish will actually go through, called the gelatinous body of, the, of, a, of a jelly and live inside it. So yeah. I don't understand fully how they do that. Yeah, um, some can, they get protection from the jellyfish right. uh, in some way. Um, so it works out for both. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, one question, was there any uh, coral bleaching noticed? No. Okay. Um, and did you see any relationships between uh, the distributions of gray seals and harbor seals and the underwater communities that you were examining? Nothing to distinguish between gray versus um, harbor seals. I mean, we just, they just weren't close enough to us. We didn't see enough of them do that, but they were prevalent off the east, north, well, I'll say prevalent. We saw them in 2019 off the northeast side of the island. Um, and they, they do screw around with you. I had one grab my left fin and almost yank my left leg off right from it. Um, scared the hell out of me. Um, and this, in 2022, we found them off the southeast side and they, from what I understand, that's where they tend to hang out mostly. And that's when they have lots of protection. There are rocks they can use both under the surface for protection and topside. Uh, they are food for certain other types of animals. So they've got cover and protection there for themselves and their pups, if they've got pups with them. Okay. Um, so uh, we, we heard from diver uh, Dan Morelli, who says that uh, they actually, uh, in the survey, we are, uh, you all were able to find a few of the mussels, um, the right. blue mussels. So that's great that that's in the inventory. That'll be show up in the report, I'm sure. Um, birds were not part of the census, but I, I think that if they were noticed, they were written down. Um, I'm just checking through these questions to make sure I get all the ones that people are asking. Uh, how many dive hours were there all together? Anybody count? I, did, I didn't add up hours, but we had a total of uh, Dan and Dave did seven uh, dives, and Jan and I did six. So we had 20, I'm sorry, 26, 27 dives for the five days. But we didn't, I've got, I haven't totaled up total dive time. Well, Megan, here's well, one for you. Um, once you have all the samples and you're finished identifying and recording uh, what what they are that you've been going through for the inventory, what do you do with them? Well, that's actually, we sent them to Dan for ID. <laughs> um, I don't think we have any use for them afterwards. I, we were careful when we were in the field lab about, um, you know, if we had seawater from the samples, I don't want to dump that in a place that it didn't come from. I don't want to inadvertently spread any invasive species. So we were careful about not disposing wow. it back at the silver sands or um, transferring anything where it didn't belong. Um, but yeah, Dan um, probably disposed of all the samples when he was done um, down in Florida. Given the strong and varying currents, uh, was uh, erosion along the coast noticed? I would just say from, from my experience, it's an erosional coast um, that, that the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the shape of Plum Island keeps getting uh, shaped. Um, but if anybody wants to add to that, um, you it know, for instance, the sand dunes at the south, uh, southwest corner um, are, you know, certainly made from wind, but uh, the sand is collected from the beaches too and from uh, erosional, so erosional um, sources. But does anybody want to add to the question? It's, it's a beach, essentially, with sand <laughs> in between the beaches. It has to move in order to function and exist. You, you can't stabilize that. You lose everything we value about it. Um, I my, when I introduce Plum Island to people that haven't heard about it before, and they focus on Plum Island itself, Louise, you've said this oftentimes in some of your interviews, um, you have to include the environment within which it's housed and shapes every element of it, and that's the waters that surround it. So if it erodes, that's not a bad thing. Erosion is not bad at all. 
What's bad is what we put in NASH protected feature areas that have to move. Then we have a problem. We don't have a problem until we put something there that doesn't belong there. Now, that's the that of, of a former coastal manager. Yeah, I was going to say, Steve used to work for the state in coastal management and protection. Right. So we're going to need to close down. I think it looks like Kurt wants to say one more thing, but I just no, no, wanted no. to, before you do, Kurt, um, our diver, uh, Dan, who's not uh, part of the presentation today, uh, noted that he he does uh, have the samples still that was part of the que earlier question and is uh, you know, willing to make a reference collection and um, also wants to let Steve Malinowski know that uh, he loves to do in faunal work and um, that there's always a lot of support needed for for that kind of work. But uh, turn, Kurt, you want to uh, you want to pitch in here, or are we going to close down our hour? Yeah, we'll close down the hour. I'll just add to what Steve said. I think what's <clears throat> so unique about Plum Island is that it's nine miles of wild, untrammeled in many ways uh, coastal system in terms of uh, erosional. <clears throat> erosional features and accretional features that all work together. So much of our Long Island Sound has been hardened and, and altered, which uh, means that lots of beaches are being starved of sediments. So this is a system that all works together, as Steve said. And I just want to thank uh, you all on the panel for all your excellent work. Steve, was a joy being out with you for the day. And uh, just a, a note to all our listeners, if you're not a member of Save the Sound, uh, you're welcome to go to our website, savethesound.org, and uh, you can join or make a donation there. Thank you, Kurt. And um, so thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Um, you will get a copy of this report, uh, which is now available. Uh, we hope you will visit our websites and we uh, really are appreciative of everybody coming on and uh, all your great questions tonight too. So on behalf of everybody here tonight, thank you and good night.